But uh, that's the presentation. And I feel uh, if you feel or if you want to, Max, feel free to stop recording. Uh, but we do have time for questions now as well, if anyone has questions. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to continue the recording, uh, but we're going to do something a little bit different. The videos are long on YouTube, so it uh, cuts the vi I'll cut this out, this part out, but the video um, starts downloading once I end the meeting here. So I'll basically split it up into two. So we'll do the presentation first, and then we'll do the you know, Q&A and discussion after. And then I will tell you guys when I stop recording so you can, um, you know, do do and say, you know, whatever you want. Um, but that was a great uh, uh, presentation. Um, I, I know we, um, thank you. I'm, it's very uh, uh, brief and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, a bird's eye view on all this stuff, but um, it is, it is some very, uh, actionable tools that you can get started right away on. Uh, to just use Bitcoin in your daily life, however you all all are, um, in just a more private way. So um, I got a few questions, but you don't want to hear me talk. So anybody uh, have any questions for Super on Bitcoin privacy? Don't be shy. Feel free to jump in. Or any or any other topic related to that. It doesn't doesn't have to be based on the um, presentation. Um, what are your questions, Max? Um, like? Yeah, yeah. My, my, my question is uh, really mainly to myself, but why did we not include um, like a VPS or I'm sorry, a, like a VPN um, in here? We have uh, Tor, but um, uh, our, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I guess there, there are I guess lots of tools my, that I. I guess here's my question. There are lots of tools that I could have gone into, and um, I wanted to include something on PGP. I wanted to include something on password managers. Yeah. I wanted to include something on um, VPNs, and I wanted to include something on Lightning. Um, and there's probably a dozen other ones that I could talk about, but um, I wanted to, I wanted to stick with the ones that are um, most commonly used in the Bitcoin space and that have the best features. Uh, and when I look at comparing Tor to a VPN. Um, I, th I think that Tor is uh, easier to use than a VPN, um, so I, I chose to use that. But that's a VPN is an alternative to Tor or something to use in conjunction with it. Um, for, well, for, for, for exchanging messages, PGP is great, but typically the kinds of messages you exchange with PGP are, um, which, which is an encrypted messaging protocol, typically they're um, they're they're not like. It's hard, to, it's hard to put it, but like if you, if you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hide much on the Bitcoin network. If you use PGP to like wrap your transactions before sending them to someone, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do much for you because once it goes, once they unwrap it and put it on the blockchain, it's still public for everyone to see. Um, so PGP doesn't help much there, but I still think it's great. And there's other things you can do with it to um, like talk about when you, especially when you're talking to other people about Bitcoin. Um, and then what was another one? Lightning. Lightning is great, but I think we just had a presentation on Lightning last week, so I didn't want to rehash everything about about it. That's why I didn't put it in this one. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. I know when we set up uh, Bitcoin nodes or you're connecting your wallets, um, you're not using a VPN. You know, you're using Tor, and the main reason why that is the distinction and. Uh, from my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, is Tor is truly decentralized, meaning each individual component of the network is being operated. Um, I mean, they could all be at one place, but it's technically operated uh, at various locations. You could run your own instance of whatever level you want. A VPN is you're connecting over to somebody else's centralized server, and you are trusting that that centralized server is keeping your information private while you are browsing online. Most do an excellent job at that, such as Bulbad. I should put that well, in the chat. They actually accept uh, Bitcoin for payment. There's no sign up or login. Um, and I heard, I think it was either from Ty or uh, from uh, Matt, that they're going to be adopting uh, Lightning payments 
um, for uh, purchasing the VPN on Molvad. But other great VPNs uh, <laughs> like Proton Mail, um, I mean, NORAD is okay, but it's pretty common. Um, the problem with VPNs is they're, you're, you're pointing to a, a, a server where Tor is actually truly distributed in terms of, of that. So it is more akin yeah, so the, to the network. That, uh, if I was trying to explain the difference between them, I would say a lot of similar things. Um, Tor is more distributed than most VPNs are. Um, and uh, Tor is, is, a lot, is, a lot like a, is, a, is a lot like a decentralized VPN, um, where you are uh, in a VPN, you connect to somebody else's computer. And then instead of showing your IP address when you connect to other people's servers, it shows theirs. Uh, with Tor, you're kind of doing that, but there's a lot of hops. Um, it's like it's like using ten VPNs in a row, kind of. Um, like, so even if they, when the person on the other side sees an IP address, they see the, the tenth person's IP, the tenth person in your chain of hops, they see their IP address, and it's way separated from yours by that point. Um, so that's that's one difference between Tor and VPNs. But there's one of the pieces of nuance is also that you can run your own VPN, you know, or you can get your friends to run VPN and then have a have a circle of friends who you who you connect to their computers um, with. Like uh, OpenVPN is is VPN software that anyone can download and run, um, and I use that on a regular basis for for VPN usage because um, I have I have a computer in Michigan and I live in Puerto Rico, so I connect to the computer in Michigan when I'm doing stuff. That way, they don't get my IP address. Puerto Rico, whatever service I'm connecting to gets an IP address at Michigan. Um, so you can you can do stuff like that with a VPN, like install your own on a computer in a remote location. Use that. Um, that's uh, that's an option. You can also get one. You can have it, install it on a friend's computer and then just like randomly select which friend you're going to use this week, or or even on every time you connect to the internet. Um, there's there's lots of cool things you can do with VPNs that you can't do with Tor. But yeah. uh, by the same token, Tor is also more more anonymous and more automated. Like you just download it, and everyone's already like set it up, set everything up for you, so it all just works. Whereas with a the VPN, there's more fiddling to do. Yeah, and and on that note, I just thought about it as well. T not not always, but typically, because a VPN is naturally more centralized, um, it has a higher uptime. Again, typically. Uh, as we experienced with the recent update on uh, Tor, um, the version three addresses um, had a bug in the system and it brought uh, a portion of the Tor network it itself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so. I, yeah, you know, and that's another that's, point. So Tor, Tor is also has central, has central points of failure. There, there is a, um, there are, there are, is a certain number of people who basically, it's, it's hard to say they run Tor, but they have like, a critical there's there's a set, there's a group of like 15 computers that have a critical role to play in the network and if those go down the whole network goes down um and they it's they don't see uh, user traffic uh, or anything like that but they they coordinate stuff and and if the point is it's not entirely decentralized it has it has centralization flaws that, that um, good people are trying to improve on so um whereas a vpn uh, typically, you're connecting to one central server, and it's likely to have really good uptime. But uh, it is also something that, like, if you set up your own VPN network with your friends, um, you're going to be more decentralized in that sense than Tor would be, because and and more and harder to take down because because it's it's you and your friends who are doing it. Like, you have you have a lot more control over what happens on the on your own VPN network than you have a control over what happens on Tor or on a central VPN. Um, I think we're getting way too into the weeds on VPNs, though. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want yeah, to. I, I want to change topics. I have a question. Um, unless anybody else uh, has has stuff, I want to stop talking. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I do have uh, a really Rich, good train. Help us out. You have you have any questions? Yeah. How about you, Jim? Jim, you're always good for a couple questions, right? Dang. Yeah. I guess not. All right. All right. Somebody I, say I something. Change, I will change the topic because I want to bring this up re, because it is specifically in 
privacy or is of privacy concern, and that is um, what is chain analysis and who are people um, like tracking like and actually like like what are the incentives to actually look at the at the blockchain and um, like who are the companies that are doing that? And by the way, chain analysis is a very evil company. <laughs> <laughs> in my personal opinion, I don't. Uh, not to not to throw in anything subjective here, so, but uh, um, so who you said two of the questions you asked were who are the chain analysts and what what is chain analysis uh, and what are the I guess a third question in there is what are the incentives to do it? The third answer is the easiest. Um, knowledge is power, right? Uh, yeah, at least yeah. to me that that's a if you can gain information about people's financials and what they're buying, how much they're sending, when they're spending their coins, where they got them, um, that's that's a lot of knowledge. You can you can you, uh, among the things you could use it for are law enforcement. You can use it for blackmail. You can use that information for um, if if it's a if it's a company who's doing it, you might be able to get an edge on on some company that they're buying and. Trade stocks based on that information. Um, get it. Get in a position before other people do because you were paying attention and they weren't. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with information about people's financials. It's very powerful info. So that's the, that's the incentive to do it. Um, then who's doing it? Uh, there is there is a company who creates software for chain uh, for analyzing the blockchain and finding out where transactions are coming from and where they're going and when and how much. Uh, that uh, chain 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 analysis is their name is the name of a company that does that. They're not the only one. Um, there was a company who made it into the news in I think September of last year for they they took a um, they took a contract with the Secret Service I think. Who knows why they're getting yeah yeah that would space. be but right. They took some yeah. contract with the Secret. Yep. They took a contract with the Secret Service to develop blockchain analysis software. And there was like a bounty program involved. And I f kind of forget what it was, but um, uh, let me see if I can find the name of the company by Googling yeah. some terms. Yeah, um, I, I put I put Chain Analysis's website in the uh, chat. But as I was thinking about it, because we're all Bitcoiners, and I guarantee you, we're not all on tour right now. So the moment that you click that link, <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna send your IP address over to their website. And because it's a Bitcoin blockchain analysis company they're immediately going to log your IP and start scrolling through the infinite amount of data um, uh, and trying to connect IP, you know, Rick's IP address to anything Bitcoin related. And I promise you something was going to pop up. The moment that I clicked that link, it hit me and I said, crap, that was the Cypher Trace. Cypher Trace is another, is another blockchain analysis company. Uh, Cypher in that case is spelled with an I, C I. P H E R trace. Um, so that's that's another chain analysis company. Um, Samurai wallet, believe it or not, they have a they have their um, their privacy wallet. They another project that they work on is a ch is chain analysis software called uh, OXT. And Samurai puts this out there uh, to create. They try to create the best uh, tool for analyzing the blockchain and breaking people's privacy, so that then um, they can defeat their own tool. And, and build their wallet in such a way that even they, you know, even our best best attempt at breaking privacy can't break our wallet. You know, that's kind of the messaging there. Um, so they they have an open source chain out chain out chain analysis software um, program uh, that anyone can download and use called OXT. Uh, just the, those letters O X and T. And if you search for that with like chain out chain out, chain analysis OXT chain analysis. It'll, Probably come up. I've actually never even Googled I, for it. So let me just see what no, happens. I, 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 I've heard about it many times. I've never been to the website, but I remember it. It's oxt.me and I put it in the chat and uh, it popped right up. And it looks, honestly, it looks great. Um, uh, it is made by Samurai. Um, it's just another version of like Blockstream.explorer, their own, their own version of the chain uh, explorer. But uh, it's very nice. Well, yeah. it's. It's not just that. I mean, if it, one thing that it does that other blockchain explorers don't is it um, it attempts to link coins to each other. Like it'll, it, um, sorry, not coins, but addresses. It'll it's called clustering. It'll try and figure out 
like the same we we have very good evidence that the same entity owns these addresses you know and then it'll it'll present these clusters to you uh, and give their evidence for why they think those are connected um, and part of the part of the goal of um, uh, of their of the samurai wallet is to fool oxt into thinking that you know that some address that they they put in a cluster it, the, the wallet wants to get this software to put it in the wrong cluster Right, and then this software OXC is also, on the other hand, it's it's trying to make sure it gets everything right, that it can defeat the privacy protections offered by Samurai Wallet. It's, it's a really neat game of back and forth. They go by attacking themselves from two different angles, but uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, is... yeah it's it's way um, it's way more detailed than other in this respect than any other blockchain um, uh, tool, blockchain explorer. Yeah, that's why I started sharing my screen here, showing everybody what um, is on their, you know, uh, text fields. And this is quite detailed. So I'm sure that's a great uh, uh, strategy. Uh, build the tool to defeat yourself and thus improve that tool to defeat, you know, the enemy, which you just created. So that's a great way to stay above. I like it. They are their they are their own worst enemy because they're the experts in privacy um, privacy protection as well as in privacy I don't know breaking they're experts at breaking your privacy as well as uh, restoring it so yes that's kind of cool any other questions about uh, Tor Fisk and other privacy concerns um I just thought about it um, any uh... I know Rick, you did this for your first uh, Bitcoin transaction, but what are uh, a list of like peer to peer, um, you know, like either in person or you can go like to a store uh, and buy Bitcoin over the counter? Is there, you know, cause it's a cash purchase. So it's, it's uh, as private as you can uh, get minus um, showing your face in front of somebody, but I want to bring up uh, Liberty X uh, for one of them. You will pay a, uh, a premium for uh, uh, the over-the-counter feed, uh, but um, that's a great way to buy uh, Bitcoin in person for cash. Um, is there any others that, that you're thinking about? Um, you know, when, I, when I first uh, started purchasing Bitcoin, my second transaction was peer-to-peer, -peer, but back then local bitcoins was a little bit different it hooked people up not and then it's, for some reason the government got into their shorts and they stopped doing it so i don't think that you can still hook up on local bitcoins peer to peer i might be wrong but i know they've it for a while you can the problem is you have to um disclose regular banking information you know regular kyc uh, so that's why it's not really recommended anymore. But yeah, local bitcoins was the uh, hot spot for a long time to for a peer to peer um, in person uh, bitcoin transactions. Yeah, because it hooked up it hooked you the, people in your area, so that you would connect with somebody who wanted to sell or somebody who wanted to buy, and then you would get in touch with each other through email, and then you'd meet somewhere physically and make the transaction. So it was completely anonymous. There was, there was nothing, there was no record of it or no tracking of it on, on the internet. So, and I think that's why the government made them stop doing it. I'm not sure how they forced them to do that, but they did. So I, I, one thing you can always do, uh, sometimes I go into Craigslist and search for the word Bitcoin and I'll find there are ads from people who are just like, yeah, meet, meet me and we'll trade Bitcoin, you know? And uh, I used to do that. Uh, and it worked out great for me. I never uh, have heard of anyone getting any having any problems doing that. So um, uh, consider using Craigslist as just a, an alternative version of that, where you just put put an ad out there that you want to go trade bitcoins and wait wait to see who shows up or or who answers your ad. Yeah, and if there, and if there's anybody on this uh, in this group right now that's in the Detroit area, there is a group in Detroit that I'm a member of. I just haven't gone up there yet, but. They meet every Tuesday, physically. They pick a different location every week, and uh, they meet just for that specific purpose to do peer-to-peer -peer transactions. 
Yeah, uh, I'm going to find the link here because, uh, yeah, we, we have not been up there uh, yet. and We've talked about it for months now. Well, I, I'm, I'm actually a member of their group. I, I could probably pretty quickly find the uh, link for it, but go ahead. Go ahead and try. I can't. Yeah, I'll find. Yeah, I'll find it here. I know. I know exactly where it's at. But I'll see if I can find it. Now, if you do that, and isn't isn't a coin like it has a history? So wouldn't that become like? Um, it could be. You could be caught for something nefarious if you do that because the coin would be re-registered to whoever got it from Coinbase, and then it ends up in the other person's wallet like how does that work well that's a um, that's a great point you, but i'll let super you know handle that yeah i think um if you take somebody else's coins you should uh one way to avoid getting having the fbi show up at your door and start asking questions um is to coin join you know is to, to use some basic privacy protection so that uh it goes to a fresh new address that no one's ever seen and that coin join blocks the uh anyone who's trying to follow that coin around from knowing where it end, knowing where it ended up. Okay. Um, and they don't know that it's yours. So that's, that's one thing you can do. Also, if the FBI did show up, you, you just say, well, I, I got this coin from a guy on, uh, you know, on, on that I met on Craigslist or on local Bitcoins or wherever, and give them the information that they asked for. We, we met at McDonald's or, or whatever. Uh, he was tall and had blonde hair and uh, give him whatever, whatever information you can get. But uh, it's not it's not illegal to meet somebody and buy and sell Bitcoin. So it's not like it's not like you're going to go to jail for doing that. No, um, no, I know. But if it's, somebody did a committed want it to be like cash. Yeah, if somebody committed a crime and then they tried to launder it through you innocently, or as far as you're 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 concerned, you were innocent. You didn't do anything wrong. And the police show up, just answer their questions and be cooperative. That's what I would do. Yeah. So you you want to make it like cash? So you want to you want to do coin join or something? Yeah, definitely um, avoid all those problems by uh, following the basic privacy protections, by, uh, some of which I laid out in here, um, yeah. so that uh, so that you don't have to, so that they can never show up at your door because they have no idea where the coins are. Okay. I found the uh, meetup. They, I guess it's a different, they must have changed the name or something, but it's the Detroit Cryptocurrency Exchange. DCX is what their name is. I'm going to put it here in the chat and um, the link for the next one. But yeah, that's what these types of events are um, another great way to get um, non KYC uh, Bitcoin privately um, face to face. Again, you are meeting in meat space, but um, it is a still another um, opportunity. I, I want to make a mention as well, what I'm thinking, um, another way to acquire uh, Bitcoin non-KYC um, would be mining. Um, and the more and more that I think about it and, and I talk with Rick and, and uh, uh, keep setting stuff up, blah, blah, blah. I'm finding out that I think we're going to reach a point where you just may not be able to buy Bitcoin in the same manner that we are right now, Coinbase, uh, any mobile apps that you have. Um, I think your only way uh, coming up in the next five to 15 years, who knows, um, without disclosing a lot of private information, of course, it's either going to be selling goods or services for Bitcoin, which is the best. Um, second would be, in my opinion, um, uh, I guess uh, mining, because um, that's that's how bitcoins are created first and foremost. Um, and then third, you would use tools, um, you know, such as Bisc. Okay, I, I or, you know, again, in any order that you that you choose. But um, it seems like it seems like these easy on ramps are going to be more and more uh, censored, and you know, a ball and chain and fees and uh, privacy information uh, to be disclosed uh, as far and wide as the arms can reach uh, for whoever is in a, 
uh, enforcing those those actions. Again, you see it exactly what happened with uh, local bitcoins. That that was the global pay, place to go for physical peer to peer meetups. But um, uh, powers that be stepped in and and put their put their rules and regulations um, in place. The Craigslist idea is is actually a great idea. It's basically a. Yeah, there's, I mean, uh, they're not going to they're not going to like forbid people. I guess the the one thing they could do in order to forbid people from using a tool like Craigslist in order to meet up is, is they could say you're not allowed to meet up. You just you're just not allowed to meet people. Um, so uh, I wonder I, in in an age of lockdowns and of uh, social distancing, I wonder if uh, how easily they could just say, yep. Yeah, in order to prevent Bitcoin trading, you're just not allowed to meet anyone. No meetups, no Craigslist. Just if, if we catch you meeting with someone, uh, you go to jail, straight to jail. Yeah, I but, uh, that uh, if if they if they ever do that, or if they if we keep heading in this lockdown direction, hopefully people who love freedom and love um, liberty will just uh, elect different leaders who don't make such rules, and then we won't have to deal with that because freedom is uh, more important than um, preventing people from trading Bitcoin. Well, a couple of things there. I, I'm not sure that we have the power to elect leaders anymore. I think that's selected for us. But also, I don't think it's necessarily even going to be COVID. I think, I think that the uh, it, it's going to get to the point where they're just going to say, uh, we don't want you people meeting and, and doing these face-to-face transactions anymore because we can't control them. In other words, we can't, the IRS yeah. know what's going on. So I think at that point, probably, uh, I think the decentralized exchanges are going to step up. Don't you guys think that's going to be the thing of the future? Well, but that's, uh, to me, that's what, uh, that's what meeting somebody and exchanging Bitcoins is. You can't get much more decentralized than meeting somebody and giving them cash right. and they give you Bitcoin. But what, but what I'm trying to say is that if the government comes out and says, hey, you are not allowed to meet in person anymore. And so then what they're going to start doing is they'll do sting operations. You know, they'll get on Craigslist and say, hey, yeah, my name's, you know, Bobby mm-hmm. Bill Rose, and I want to meet you and buy some crypto. And then when you show up and try to make the exchange, they slap cuffs on, cuffs on your hands. So what I'm saying is that in the end, it should be a decentralized exchanges that people can go to. I mean, sure. does, yeah, does I think I uh, but- yeah, I, I, I like the way you put that because one better thing about doing these things over the internet is that on the internet, um, th- there's no opportunity for them to slap cuffs on you. Uh, and on the internet, you can you can maintain privacy by using tools like PGP and VPNs and Tor to uh, make it so that they can't trace your communications to the source. And then when you do your purchase, you can use methods like, like money orders, cash by mail, and other things that that uh, aren't, aren't traceable back to you. So uh, yeah, I think you, you've put it in a good way. If they, if they, if they forbid meeting up um, and, and then try to, and then do sting operations and start slapping cuffs on people, uh, we'll have to turn to cryptography tools that are available on the internet in order to defeat those, um, in order to defeat those measures. So do you know, I think, uh, do, we, do we know of any decentralized exchanges right now? Well, sure. I mentioned BISC, right? Um, that's that's one. That's the one that I tend to use. Um, it's the only one I've used, actually. Um, another Trade. one is local cryptos. Go ahead. What were you about to say, Christine? There's a few from um, I got from the Dollar Vigilante. I can uh, put the link. Do share. Yeah, go ahead. Put the link in the chat. Share. Thank you. Yeah, because I think that's really the wave of the future. I mean. You know, getting away from Coinbase and all these places that that's where the government's going to go to try and, and you know, uh, throttle the on ramps and the off ramps. So if we can just come up with some just keep coming up with decentralized exchanges that people can go to, you know, I think that's probably what's going to save us. Just my two cents. You can use uh, Uniswap. Right, but you can't um, on Uniswap. You, it's hard to get fiat currency into into Uniswap in order to trade it. Yet it's only a, it's a crypto to crypto only exchange. So um, when you're trying to buy bitcoins by 
taking your paycheck and turning it into bitcoins at, at least to, to my knowledge you can't use uniswap for that uh, perhaps i'm perhaps i'm wrong but it's my understanding do you know more about it ryan um yeah you're right i mean soon i think uh banks are going to be doing stables so stable coins would be um the way in maybe but yeah, yeah, if, if, if thanks let us um, i, I want to mention ahead, ryan man. that you just said something on that point i know i can't find the link please somebody uh share it if you know uh what the website is or the link but uh the uh occ the office of the computroller of the currency released documents it was the second one uh i don't know if it was this if it was in january of this year or if it was december two months ago they released documents that banks are now legally um uh, allowed to uh use any uh, uh cryptographic protocols to transfer funds so if they wanted to make their own jp morgan uh you know stable coin um, and run it on however they want, uh, run it on their own, run it on something else. Um, uh, you can do that. So, but again, that 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 issue goes into how do you get that stablecoin into the people's hands so they can go and send that onto said you know decentralized exchange. Yeah, that's yeah, the that's, issue. Yeah, that's that. You're right. That's the something I hadn't thought about is uh yeah you still have to go through a fiat on ramp yeah exactly that, exactly. that just that dawned on me that just a few seconds ago that dawned on me that even with a decentralized exchange you still need to get the fiat on there somehow but um i i just well, that's, I can't help that's what it, to, to me like almost the only game in town is this it's the, it's the only it's almost the only one where you can you trade with somebody else for fiat currency right like you have to send cash or you have to send a money order, you have to send um, Zelle payments or there's some other thing that is real real US dollars in a, in a bank account and then turned into cash. Um, and that like, there's, there's not many decentralized exchanges that, are, that work that way. They're almost, almost all of them with the exception of BISC are crypto to crypto only. And, and when you use them, it's like, you're just, you're just moving the problem of how, how do I get the crypto like it's like once you have the crypto, yeah, you can swap it for other cryptos easily. But like, how do you get the crypto? You know, and that's what Bisc is great for because you can use it to go from fiat to Bitcoin without needing um, in a decentralized fashion. But it has its own problems, like being slow and expensive. So, yeah, we still need to make improvements. Yeah, so. I did. I did hear um, Binance, and I know it was under. I know many people are doing this. It's sliding under. Uh, the news they didn't really announce it that big so it's probably not that big of a deal uh, but I know Binance announced uh, Binance Pay I don't know when they did it was recent or a while ago but th I think that exact issue that we're talking about is what companies like Binance and others are looking at now and saying okay great we got all this stuff uh, but we can't get that into people's hands. The transfer is not that easy. And it just hit me as well that I don't think the legacy systems and the governments that be want a simple exchange from, you know, fiat cash to crypto right. or, you know, people to be able to pay or deposit their stable coins or receive it for their weekly paycheck or, yeah. Of course not. Of course not. What, what what if and this? Well, that's what Ryan, Ryan mentioned. If banks release stable coins, that will help a lot. I think it probably will, because I think they'll do a really terrible job of what they want to do, and there will be a lot of <laughs> backdoor ways that you can use them on these central decentralized exchanges. But um, their their intention with those is not going to be that you can send them to anyone you want. It's going to be like you can only send these to. At least my my thinking is like you can only send these currencies to people that we approve, and have KYC. So. You know, if you want to use your your thing on Uniswap or whatever, or some decentralized exchange, you have to get that person's identity and tell it to us, and and we have to confirm it, and then you can send them the coins. And it's like, well, that's not really a decentralized, or it's still it'd be still decentralized. It wouldn't be anonymous anymore, and it would take away the advantage of using using yeah. these things. Yeah. What what if you re, what if you went retro on these uh, decentralized exchanges? Let's say 
you have a decentralized exchange that you know you can you can get on and you can buy all, any type of crypto you want with fiat currency. But the problem is getting the fiat currency into the, into the exchange. Well, what if you went back in time and started using something old fashioned like mailing money? You know, mm -hmm. why couldn't you, you know, drop money into an envelope, send it to these to these uh, decentralized exchanges, then they have your your fiat list and then you make your purchases. I mean, it's it's slow, but. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's what I that's what I do on BISC. Um, I use the, the cash by mail is one of the options, but money orders are slightly safer and they're, um, are, they're just as good in, in that respect, in my opinion. Um, so that's what I use on BISC is I just, I send it straight through the mail to the count to whoever I'm buying the Bitcoins from. Um, and then the other option that you, that you just mentioned, or uh, you didn't mention it, but uh, going back to the stable coin idea, um, the, the, the key issue with stable coins is if, if there's a way to just send your stable coins to someone, um, then we can, then we can use that. Like we can, we can make it so that whoever you're trading it to will send you bitcoins in return and just not tell the government what they that they did that you know that would just be all the government will see is that you sent them uh stable coins but i think they're going to make that really difficult I, I, the government has no idea how to build technology and they their intentions are are nefarious with it um, but one of the one of the things they want to do is by getting everyone onto these um government issued stable coins they want to prevent people from having the option of putting cash in the mail because you can't put a stable coin in the mail, you know? So I think that's, that's part of their intention is just to like get complete control over this thing so that you can't do, um, you can't do anything without their permission and their, in their oversight and their approval. But, um, but I, I don't, I don't want that future. I want a future where, where we have liberty and freedom and, yeah. Uh, only go to jail if we do something wrong and and not because like oh, well you didn't follow you didn't give us the name of whoever you were sending money to that's not that's not fair or free you know, are, are you are you familiar with uh, strike at all Dan I may have asked yeah you I have a, I have a strike account okay so with strike can't you use fiat to send I mean like I can feed fiat in at my end and it comes out in and I receive the other end. So could you use something like that to, to fund an, a decentralized exchange? The, pro the problem is with strike. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be decentralized though. Yeah, that, the, yeah, the biggest problem with strike is you're using, you're using Jack Mahler's node. That's, what, that's the biggest problem right there. You're, you're, well, first of all, as we talked before- He has complete control over everything that happens, right? Yeah, it's a central and, point and that, of failure. If the government wants to wants to shut down decentralized exchanges, and somebody's using Strike to build a decentralized exchange, they're just going to go to knock on Strike's door and say, "Hey, don't send to these people, or or shut down your service because people are using it in this way we don't like." And uh, Jack would have no option but uh, but to comply. He'd have to either say, "All right, I'm shutting them down," or if he can't shut them down, if he says, "Oh, I don't I don't have information into what they're doing," then they'll just say, "Then turn off your turn off your service." You know, we don't we don't want people using this. At least that's my imagination of yeah, no, you're an probably, adversarial scenario. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, the, yeah. The the problem with strike is not only are you using you know their node to send stuff, you can't connect to your own lightning node yet. But you obviously you're connecting over to whatever fiat on ramp you're choosing. If you're in Europe, you're going to use euros. You know, if you're in uh, you know the UK, you're going to use pounds. Wh whatever. Uh, but you still have to link. I think it's uh, uh, what's the back end link uh, Stripe? Is that it? Like uh, For the Stripe? app? No, 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 no. Not not Stripe the Bitcoin Lightning you know payment thing, but the credit card process thing. Stripe S T R I P E. I believe that's who they use for their back end to connect over your banking information. Like ninety percent oh, of use plaid. Who who is it? They use a they use a. Plaid, P L A I D. Plaid, that's it. Called that's plaid too. Yeah, it's Plaid. Thank you. Yeah, Plaid is, um, you know, uh, 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 how do I? I don't even know how to phrase it. Um, you know, they they are in the financial system, <laughs> and so they have, they can have to comply with all the regular. They're, they're a company that connects bank accounts. 
Yes. They, they connect. Thank you. Um, Thank if you, you have a Chase bank account and someone else has a U.S. bank bank account, um, so Plaid has integrations with both of them and allows you to send money from your um, Strike or from your Chase bank account to whatever other bank is part of their system. Um, and most banks in the United States are part of Plaid's system, so they that that enables payment payments to smoothly go from bank to bank if you if you use Plaid. Um, and Plaid tries to make themselves invisible by um, by like integrating with like the, you, you, the user doesn't have to know that they're using Plaid. The bank will use Plaid to send the, send your money, and then and then it just happens in the background. Yeah. Um, most people have never heard of Plaid, but it's a important company in the U.S. banking um, space. But but I mean, but that's a great point, though, Rick. I mean, if you could build the decentralized version of Strike. I mean, that's really game over, right? I mean, you know, Strike already essentially defeated, uh, you know, the financial uh, system like Swift, uh, the, the, the payment rails like uh, Swift. Um, but, man, if you could build a distributed version of Strike, oh, my God. Well, that, and that's why, over. that's why I bring stuff like that up because, you know, if a guy like me doesn't really know that much about, you know, coding or, or building uh, blockchains and things like that, if I can think of it, then probably there's a lot of whole lot of smart guys out there that are already starting to think about it. Hopefully they're on their way to building these things. Yeah, somebody's working on that style, if if not Jack himself. Yeah. Is there any more um uh like privacy related questions or so? We're at about uh, like an hour and 40 minutes on the recording. Uh, no, about an hour and a half on the recording. So it's about uh, about 40 minutes each for the presentation and uh, uh, q and A. I'm trying to keep it under an hour or so. Seems like that's good for the YouTube, you know, viewing and stuff. It doesn't drag on too long. But um, again, I can edit all this stuff out and, and piece it together. But uh, is there any other... Um, like privacy related uh, Bitcoin questions uh, for that? Or um, if not, I can end uh, the recording. We can continue the discussion. I would just like to mention that thanks to, thanks to this um, chat, Bitcoin briefly pierced 38,000 uh, 38, during this talk. Woo! Um, and came back. We're, we're slightly under that now. We're at 37.8, but I thought that was cool. Uh, start start presenting again. Yeah. Point, like, like our conversation. <laughs> yeah. 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 Super. Super pumped up the uh, the NGU tech. Uh, you really uh, you really primed that number. Well, if there's, if there's nothing else, um, again, thank you guys um, for uh, joining us on the recording. And we will see you next week.